Okay, now chapter 10. The history of ancient India, unfortunately, on the fly like this. I don't really have a good map of India, but here we have it. It doesn't really show the ecology of the region. You can see where the Mediterranean is, the temperate zone. This is actually subtropical. The equator is just below India, so now we're in a, uh, a more intense subtropical environment, which is to say, what's the main thing that we see? Well, you get the monsoon rains. It's, uh, ultimately, it's relatively dry here in northern India, uh, but there is the potential for hydraulic civilization because of the Indus River in the west and the Ganges here in the east that brings down the snow melt from the Himalayas. Uh, and so irrigation became possible, and we have irrigation in the Indus, uh, certainly by 5000 BC, so close enough to Samaria that probably um, the technology of grain production was conveyed uh, by sea. Um, we have the mountains separating it from neighboring peoples, although the invasion route was relatively accessible through the Khyber and the Swat passes down, and that's the pattern that we see invasion coming this way from Afghanistan downward into the Indus again and again over historical time. Uh, we have uh, high temperatures. Average temperature for the year is like 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, we have the monsoon rains that bring the same sort of storm patterns that go across and cause our hurricanes across the Atlantic as the sun moves across the equator and creates the great storms of Central Africa. Uh, and uh, as a result, especially um, here in the Central Highland, the Deccan Peninsula of India, uh, uh, sub rainforest, not as dense as Africa, but we're dealing with a jungle environment in which you can go and clear the land, clear a path, come back the next year, it's completely grown in again. One of the things that we see with India is that land clearance itself was a major challenge to urban civilization. This is the southernmost area where we see urban civilization taking place in antiquity. It's really quite extraordinary. But we know that the kings, particularly on the Ganges, had to uh, subsidize land clearance as a phenomenon of rural expansion, of urban expansion, of opening up land to cultivation and what have you. So we have to kind of recognize the extreme challenge that there was to trying to build urban civilizations in an environment uh, uh, like this. And then you've got to add things like the kinds of wild animals that live in these forests. So we've got tigers, we've got large animals that are very, very dangerous, um, we've got poisonous snakes. Uh, and so, you know, uh, living in these villages out in the jungles at nighttime was a challenge. Let's just say it was a challenge. So we have to allow that. And the reason I stress all this is because it makes the development of urban and say, civilizations such as occurred in this area all the more extraordinary uh, in, in that regard. Okay, so uh, the broad range of ecological diversity in the Indian subcontinent posed a significant challenge to the formation of urban societies in, in India. Despite the surrounding desert, two crops a year were possible in the Indus Basin. Land clearance was the single greatest challenge to urban development in the Ganges. The Indus Valley riverine culture began by at least 3000 BC. It was a highly urban culture with more than a dozen sites. Harappa to the north, Mahindradal to the south. Uh, these were twin capitals of a civilization that covered an area four times the size of Samaria and twice the size of the Egyptian Old Kingdom. Uh, and these cities are quite remarkable. They used fired brick already by 2000 BC. They built these massive granary complexes. Uh, and and um, even their social formation may have had some significant continuity. Uh, there is no palace, there's no sense of a royal hierarchy, and, and to the extent that anthropologists even describe these as sort of headless states. Uh, but we have these bathing uh, uh, monuments, steps down into a bathing pool and steps up on the other side, and the position between what seems to be sort of a monastic resonance and the silos for the grain storage. And one argument is that there was some sort of bathing ritual similar to what we see in Hindu culture on the Ganges, that the inhabitants would produce the grain for the priestly caste, it would be stored in the silos, and it would be redistributed to the inhabitants once they had performed these bathing ablutions. Uh, and so we've got a priestly hierarchy that seems to be controlling these city-states along the uh, Indus. I mean, this is theoretical, hypothetical, but it's entirely within the construct of what we know in historical Hindu 
um, civilization itself. It also suggests that this culture, the culture of the Indus, which probably was Dravidian in its origin, percolated up after the Indo Europeans conquered uh, the Indus and kind of percolated up from below and created a fused or mixed culture as a result. Uh, by 1850 BC, Indo-European, Indo-Iranian, Indo-European, or Aryan, is what they called themselves, invaders, destroyed and submerged the uh, Indus Valley culture. The Indo-Iranian invaders brought with them a Vedic oral tradition, and this is directly connected to one of our earliest vestiges of early Indo-European culture, which was eventually preserved in Sanskrit. This evolved into the sacred literature of the Vedic era, 1200 to 1000 BC. The Indo-Iranian newcomers had extreme difficulty assimilating to native culture, as well as to the racially different Dravidian inhabitants. And in the Vedic hymns, there were discussions of these uh, uh, dark-skinned uh, demons that would come out of the jungle at night and attack them and had to be uh, pacified. So there's a clear kind of racial sort of uh, thing going on here, coming to terms with these Indo-Europeans probably were small populations that came in and supplanted the hierarchy and then living there over generations realized they're outnumbered and they married into it and eventually you get a fused mixed population but the process of fusion uh, in the process of fusion the hierarchy, the, the uh, Indo-Iranian hierarchy tried to preserve its place through segregated um, uh, uh, reproductive systems and a caste society ultimately uh, emerged. During the epic era, approximately 1000 to 600 BC, uh, this hierarchy organized a strictly ordered caste system of social hierarchy based on the supremacy of the warrior caste or the Kshatriyas, followed by the priest or the Brahmin caste, uh, the merchant and farmer caste, the Vajas, and the subsistence laborers, the Sudras. The fifth group, the Dazyas, again, this is this demonic uh, people, the untouchables, uh, lived outside the confines of settled uh, communities uh, and uh, evolved uh, outside the reorganized orders. Uh, originally in the Vedic hymns, the Kshatriyas were the leadership, but the Brahmins ultimately supplant them uh, through their moral supremacy. But there's a lot of give and take there, especially with expansion into the Ganges. It was typical for the Kshatriya class to send their youths to be educated in the centers of learning here on the Indus, such as places such as Patsila, ancient centers of learning for Hindu culture. Uh, but we hear about the kind of corruption that pervaded the Brahmin caste. They, there was this system, their religious system was full of divinities, thousands of divinities, and full of rituals, all these meticulous rituals that if done poorly would have to be redone, so you have to kind of pay and there were instances of corruption and bribery that lead to uh, 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 breakaway religious worldviews, which is basically what the Jainists and the Buddhists were. Um, the Hindu belief in the transmigration of the soul found its earliest record in the Upanishads, or the hymns of the epic era, 1600. This worldview world gradually supplanted the minimalist worldview of the Vedic beliefs while reinvigorating them with high spiritual content. Hinduism also furnished a moral system to legitimize the caste system. Uh, prevailing levels of violence in the epic era led to the rise of Protestant philosophical movements such as Jainism and Buddhism. Jainism was strictly nonviolent and heterodox, did not accept Hindu worldview at all. Gautama Buddha, uh, who lived again in 567 to 487 BC, somewhere in there, articulated a ter an alternative or middle way. In both philosophies, moral action added positive and or negative values to one existence and determined one place, one's place in the next world. So, the notion of transmigration of soul, of reincarnation, the notion of that there is this one cosmic entity, the Atman, and that by reliving cycles of life and we are advancing toward oneness with the Atma. Um, Buddhism really didn't challenge this Hindu view. 
in more took the philosophical perspective of, okay, given that there are hundreds of thousands of thoughts, and given that there is this essence, and that we are all moving gradually towards oneness with the Atman, what is the best way to live our lives here and now? This is, again, a pattern that we've seen with the Hebrew Ten Commandments, or the Zoroastrian notion of free will, that humans have to choose which side they're going to serve for the gods. Uh, again and again, we increasingly see philosophical tenets that basically ask the question, how to live now in the mortal world? How to live a just life in an unjust world? That's not sort of the main ethical theme that pervaded ancient philosophy from the Mediterranean all the way to China. And it's interesting that it's breaking out along this arc pretty much at the same time. We even refer to this as the axial age of sort of intellectual breakthrough. Exactly why it's happening now is a good question. Has it got to do with just development to levels of urban complex society, education and philosophy, or is it an idea that's kind of sort of ricocheting from one culture to the other, being carried by travelers? Uh, and we know that these priests themselves, these Buddhist monks, would travel. They were itinerary groups. Uh, when Alexander invaded India, he brought back the leading Jainist priests with him uh, he didn't quite make it, but his followers did, to the Mediterranean. So we know there is a sort of trans uh, um, um, dissemination of philosophical ideas, at least between the Indus and the Mediterranean. Um, the independence and deep-seated animosities left Indus Valley polities exposed to repeated external invasions. External invasions variously, invariably proceeded along land routes that descended from the Afghan plateau and included the Persians under Darius I, who conquered India around um, 520 BC, the Macedonians under Alexander the Great, who invaded India around 328 to 326 BC, and then later we have the, uh, uh, the Kushan and the Huns. These invasions typically set in motion native empires of reaction. So these invaders come in, they sort of trash the place, and the natives respond by consolidating their militaries and to, to expel the, native, the uh, invaders and even to project force outside of, in, of the Indus as a way to sort of thwart future invasions. And so we see, for example, the Mauryan dynasty of Chandragupta and Ashoka, 322 to 232 BC, uh, extending their power out of the Indus across Afghanistan, penetrating as far as the...